Hello there and welcome to Newsline. It's Wednesday, January 1st. I'm Catherine Kobayashi in Tokyo. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe released his New Year's message. He says his government will do everything it can to overcome deflation and revitalize the economy. Abe also restated his hope to amend the constitution. The Prime Minister says the government is still halfway toward overcoming 20 years of deflation. He says the government will continue its efforts to bring back a strong economy. On the diplomatic and security fronts, Abe says Japan will play a more aggressive role in maintaining stability around the world. He says Japan should follow active pacifism in the 21st century. Abe says it's necessary to deepen national discussions on revising the constitution established almost 68 years ago. The Prime Minister cited the 2011 disaster evacuees. They're spending the new year in evacuation shelters for the third time. Abe says the government will redouble its effort to enable survivors to live in new homes in 2015. He says the government will work toward allowing displaced residents of Fukushima to return to normal life. I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds. The Fairwinds team has been getting a lot of emails lately about decommissioning Fukushima and comparing it to Chernobyl and to Three Mile Island. So I thought I'd use this short video to talk to you about the differences between those three reactors, all of whom had meltdowns. After the accident at Three Mile Island, human beings had entered the containment within one year of the time of the accident. And within six years of the time of the accident, the nuclear core had been completely removed because while it had collapsed, it didn't ever leave the nuclear reactor. At Chernobyl, things were different. The Russians built a complete building over top of the damaged nuclear reactor within six months of the nuclear accident. It's called the sarcophagus. And when that sarcophagus was being built, Russians went into the reactor building and determined where the melted core was. They sent robots in and they were able to find something that's now called the elephant's foot. It was about 100 tons of molten nuclear fuel underneath the nuclear reactor. This brings me to the reason for this video. There are huge differences between the, the dismantlement of Fukushima and the dismantlement of even something as bad as Chernobyl. And the difference is the groundwater. At Chernobyl, the groundwater never got in and got in direct contact with the nuclear fuel. Whereas at Daiichi, the nuclear fuel is in contact with the groundwater because the groundwater has leaked into the bottom of the containment building and it's gotten into other buildings that surround the containment. That makes Fukushima Daiichi much more expensive to solve and much more difficult to contain. The key is to keep the water out. And I've been saying this for 30 months now. The solution is not to pump water out of the containment, but to prevent the water from going in. What we need is an underground wall. Just like the sarcophagus covers the top of Chernobyl, we need an underground sarcophagus to prevent the groundwater from entering Fukushima reactors. I think once that's accomplished, there's no need to decommission these power plants and turn them back to the ground they are in. And the reason for that is that the exposure to young, brave Japanese workers is going to be way too high for almost 100 years. Because of the explosions and because of the fact that the groundwater has moved parts of the nuclear fuel out into surrounding buildings, the risk to the workers is way too high. It's time to contain the groundwater, cover up that site and walk away for a hundred years. The Japanese government doesn't want that to happen because they want their population to think that this is a solvable problem. It isn't. The best thing for the Japanese to do is to admit that they're going to have to live with radioactive rubble at the Fukushima site for over a hundred years.
Japan's population shrank last year at its fastest pace since the end of World War II. This marks the seventh straight year of decline. A health ministry survey shows that about 1,031,000 babies were born in 2013. That's down 6,000 from the previous year and the fewest since the end of the war. The estimate also shows around 1,275,000 people died last year. That's an increase of about 19,000 since 2012. It's the largest number in one year since after the war. These figures show Japan's population dropped by more than 240,000 last year. Ministry officials say the population is projected to further decrease. The nation is aging and the number of women of childbearing age is falling. Japan is developing a small, low-cost satellite to meet demand in emerging countries. The space launch is planned for this summer. Japan's new satellite, Asnaro, will go into space by August using a Russian rocket. The price will be less than $95 million. That's around one-third the price of a Western-made satellite with the same performance. The low cost is due to downsizing and use of ordinary electric instruments. Asnaro is fitted with a powerful camera. It can identify small details on Earth, such as the make of a car from an altitude of 500 kilometers. The satellite is especially useful in urban planning and analyzing disaster zones. Asia, the Asian region experiences many disasters, so this will probably be one of our target areas among emerging nations. Ministry officials plan to start full-scale promotion about a year after performance checks following the scheduled launch. The island of Kiribati have heard endless arguments about climate change. They saw negotiators at the latest UN conference go back and forth, then promised to submit targets for cutting greenhouse gas emissions. But for residents of Kiribati, the time for talking about climate change has already passed. NHK World's Takeo Nakajima explains. Waves break over ocean roads, and seawater floods into people's homes. The sea level is rising, and the people of Kiribati are under siege. The country of Kiribati, over 30 small islands in the Pacific Ocean, is home to 100,000 people. This is the highest place in this island, around 3 meters above sea level. At such low elevation, Kiribati is on the front line of global warming. The ocean's advance never stops. At high tide, the water now covers the land all around the houses here. I do concern about Kiribati people, but um, I don't really know the answer. Salt water has contaminated this well and residents have lost their drinking water. Farmland is under threat. This field is now useless for planting crops. It's estimated that Kiribati has lost about 10% of its agricultural land over the past decade. Area Mairere lives in a village by the ocean. Residents here have endured repeated flooding and they've had enough. One by one, area's neighbors are leaving. As you can see, the, the remaining of the building here, one family live here, but they have moved out, as you can see. This is the floor of their house. This is another small storeroom they have, but nothing they can do. They have to move out to some other places. This is a long-term computer forecast from the Japan Meteorological Agency and the University of Tokyo. It shows that sea level will rise an average of 20 centimeters around the world by 2035. The sea level around Kiribati is expected to rise more than 20 centimeters. Predictions like that have forced Kiribati's government to take some drastic measures. Officials are planning to buy land in Fiji, 2,000 kilometers away. They've identified a 2,000 hectare plot with an asking price of around $8 million. The plan is to grow food on the land. 
but the government does not rule out the idea of using the site for relocating Kiribati residents who have lost their homes. We see that uh, the projection for total submersion and total loss of land will become an eventuality for us. So we need to prepare and we need the international community to assist us as we prepare for all eventualities. Kiribati is preparing for the worst case scenario. The tide is rising and these island people know one day leaving their homeland may be the only option left. Takeo Nakajima, NHK World, Tarawa, Kiribati. A traditional festival to expel evil spirits on New Year's Eve has been held in a city in northern Japan. The event in Oga City features namahage who are believed to be divine messengers in Japanese folklore. The scary looking devils go to houses and drive away the bad luck of the old year. Some small children cried when they came close to them. The namahage encouraged and ordered the children to be good and obey their parents. <laughs> story to share with you before we wrap up. Worshippers are packing into a major shrine in Tokyo on New Year's Day to pray for good luck for the coming year. At midnight, the sound of a drum resonated throughout Meiji Shrine in central Tokyo. This was the cue for worshippers to begin prayers and throw monetary offerings into a large collection space. It's traditional in Japan to visit Buddhist temples and Shinto shrines during the first few days of the new year. My dream is to play an important role abroad, so I want to study English hard. It's best if everyone can promote peace and be healthy. Many worshippers buy good luck charms and arrow amulets. They also write their wishes on wooden plaques. Priests at the shrine say they expect about 3 million visitors between Wednesday and Friday. The large number is due in part to many foreign travelers.